Hi, I am Dr. East and I am here with Sharon Weizenbaum and we have so much incredible information to share with you. First, we're going to talk about, and I'm going to ask Sharon to describe her discussion and her talk. She has an entire day at symposium this year, 2022, a pre-symposium day on classical dynamics of fertility and early pregnancy. If you don't know Sharon, you got to get to know her a little bit more because I just did and I am so excited. She is an educator, a translator, a practitioner who has been specializing for over 25 years in obstetrics and gynecology with a distinct specialty in herbs and classical formulas within this realm. And we've got a treat for you. There's even more we're going to talk about in some recent translations that Sharon has been doing around medicine in the relationship with nature. But let's start with the first pre-symposium session that you're offering, Sharon, and that is uh, called Classical Dynamics of Fertility and Early Pregnancy. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I started off, um, you know, early in my herbal studying, I uh, went to mainland China and studied with Dr. Zhou Xiaomi, um, and I would say that she is kind of a TCM herbalist and you know so that was sort of my foundation but she definitely had connections to the classics which I didn't really have a connection to the classics but in retrospect I realized that she was sort of steeped in the old texts and that had, that comes through in her uh, clinical work as well as in her writing um, so I was very lucky to go early in my career, um, that was in 1990, that I went and lived in Hangzhou and studied with Dr. Cho Um, So lucky to be able to study with an obstetrician, um, a Chinese herbal obstetrician, um, as well as a gynecologist. And I also studied with her disciple, Dr. Chong Yufeng, as well. Um, and, um, yeah, and her methods were just incredible. And I learned so much and then came back and worked with those methods clinically for many years. It's actually been 40 years <laughs> um, that I've been practicing. I know, I can't believe it. Um, and uh, yeah, and then um, later I started getting very interested in classical formulas and not just classical formulas, but the principles behind the classical formulas. Um, and so I'll be talking about those principles a lot and how we apply them to women's physiology around fertility as well as pregnancy. You know, so I think that the participants will find they'll get a sort of different um, sense of how women's bodies work from this classical perspective. You know, so when we say classical formulas, you know, we're talking about the formulas of Zhang Zhongjing from the Jingwei Yalui and the Shang Hong Lun. Um, and so, you know, somebody who's interested in classical formulas, it's not just that these formulas are amazing, which they are, um, their architecture is so elegant and profound. The way that they work is so uh, magical, but that's not the only thing. Um, for me, what's exciting about the classical formulas are the underlying principles and, and at least how I understand the underlying principles. So there are lots of Jingfang doctors, you know, Jingfang means classical formulas. And there are lots of different doctors like Dr. Huang Huang or Feng Shirlun um, who think about classical formulas in really different ways than me, but also really different ways from each other. And those are both teachers I've studied with quite a lot. Um, and so the particular way that I have come to look at the principles of the Shang Han Lun 
also end up relating to how I'm going to talk about our relationship with nature. Um, but it, it, it's really been inspired by um, Dr. Liu Lihong, who wrote the book Classical Chinese Medicine. And it relates to the circular dynamics of the universe. And what does that mean? That if we think about yin yang, we think about the sun rising and the sun setting, or the moon waxing and the moon waning, or the, the seasons coming and going, that, that all has a relationship with these repetitive cycles. And that these are the cycles that are at work in our bodies. And these represent well-being in the sense of when we're aligned with the cycles of nature and our own cycles of things going up and out and down and in, when they're rhythmic and aligned, that's how we define health. You know, so modern Chinese medicine uh, has its own beauty, but it's more about do I have enough chi or enough blood? Is my blood moving properly? Are my kidneys strong or not strong? Which is I, actually part of classical Chinese medicine as well. But the view of classical Chinese medicine that I'm then going to bring to fertility and early pregnancy is really um, about the restoring the dynamic that will nourish our blood or strengthen our chi or, um, you know, let me try to think how to say it. Um, you know, if for example, there's excess heat in the body, from a TCM perspective, we might say, I'm gonna go in and clear heat, right? Because there's too much heat and that makes sense. However, from a classical perspective, any excess is related to a blockage of our life force. And the life force mm -hmm. is warm, right? Because when we're dead, we're cold. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So the nature of being dead is that there's no more warmth. And so life is warm, but if our natural warmth gets blocked, then we develop heat. And that would be an excess heat because it's this buildup due to a blockage. So from a classical perspective, we're not looking at that heat as just something we have to get rid of. We're looking for where in the dynamic is there this lack of movement? Where do I have to open things up? You now in that location, you know, we're thinking about this movement of warmth in our body and depending where the block is, you use different formulas and different herbs. So in diagnosis, we're trying to determine where is the block. And, and it's incredible because when you open up the block, the heat clears, right? Whereas in, in TCM, the way I learned it, it was more like if there's heat, you wanna come in with a lot of cold, Mm -hmm. and do the opposite, just clear that heat, just make it go away by bringing in a lot of cold. In classical formulas, you don't think about that at all. In fact, you wouldn't even necessarily think of the herbs as being so cold. You're thinking of them as opening up a block, you know? So you're kind of going a step deeper and restoring movement. And we would say that that, Block means the body is going too slow for time. Like nature is moving, right? And it's saying time to poop. But my body <laughs> is like saying, you know, no, I'm not going to poop. It's going too slow. It's supposed to be moving, but my body's going too slow. So I have to recalibrate my body to be aligned with time, right? And there's, there are these large cycles like waking up and going to sleep or being hungry and then 
you know, eating and then waiting, you know, being hungry again, eating and then waiting, you know, the cycles of digestion, the cycles of breath, and they're tiny cycles, like the cycles of the pulses. And so how do we align those cycles so they're not going too fast for time or too slow for time? So the, for me, John Zhong Jing's formulas can all be viewed in how they work with getting our body back right with time. So that for me is just so beautiful. So bringing that to fertility, you know, like I'm ovulating too soon or I'm not ovulating enough. You know, am I going, what, what is my body's relationship with time? And as a practitioner, then how do we determine that in our patient? And how do we get them right with time? So there's an innate idea in this that these processes in our body, when we're right with time, these processes happen beautifully. You know, so we don't have to make someone ovulate. We don't have to make them have a period. You know, it's natural for a woman's body at a certain phase in her life to ovulate regularly and in a healthy way. So what's making that not happen? And when we realign, then these processes come back naturally. And and for me, it's it's an exciting way of working because it's so much more effective, you know, than saying, oh, the body's not ovulating. What herbs do I give to make the body ovulate? You know, um, you won't be nearly as effective as if you realign the body with these natural cycles. Um, so I don't know if that that is, I mean, I, that is beautiful. You articulate yourself so beautifully. I'm just mesmerized by this. A question that comes to my mind is in the cases of infertility, do you find the majority of those cases are blocks, deficiencies? And like you just said, an excess isn't necessarily an excess, it's a block somewhere in the body. So in your experience with infertility, uh, what seems to be the majority of the issues? Is it the block, the deficiency or block due to deficiency? Can you explain a little bit about that one and, and then your herbal approach to it? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, you know, if we define excess and deficiency an excess is always some kind of a block, right? Okay. And so we want to think of where the block is you know, what has accumulated there is important, but in some ways less important than opening the block, you know? So they're damp or blood stasis. It might have accumulated there, but if I just go in and try to get rid of damp and blood stasis, it's not going to be as effective as opening the block, as well as looking at what, what accumulated because of the block. So one thing is just excess is that accumulation due to a blockage. And you, you picked up on it really well that sometimes an excess can be due to a deficiency, right? Like if something isn't flowing strongly, it can start to accumulate as well. So that's something we really want to determine in our diagnosis. Like, we can see a local excess due to a systemic deficiency. Mm -hmm. So if a if a if a excess is a block, then what's a deficiency? What do you think? Got any ideas? What is a deficiency then? If an excess is a blockage, so things build up, then a deficiency is any thoughts? Mine? Oh boy, here yeah. comes the educator in you. <laughs> um, well, the deficiency is just the result of the block because we're it's a full okay. system here. So I could see just starting with removing the block helps things moving, which 
uh, since we're one full system, will eventually start to or refuel the deficiency, but we still need to come in with herbs. And I'm, I'm with you on the power of herbs in our medicine. The herbs can come in and be specific in treating whatever deficiency there is while also removing the block. It can, yeah. Harmoniously, I mean, yeah. There's often, and I, you know, to answer your question, I would say probably overall, more of what I see is deficiency, you know, yeah. I mean, there's still, there's, there's blockage due to deficiency and there's some that's more pure, to, more pure excess. But what I was pointing to with deficiency is that the, we have like the zong and the fu, right? The zong fu organs and the fu is a hollow organ, right? And hollow means something has to be opened through. And so the hollow organs, their pathology is generally blockage because what they're supposed to do is open through. But the zong yin organs, zong means to store, right? And so the zong are storing what's precious, like the blood and the yin and the yang, you know, it's all stored. And so we could define excess as failure to store properly. So things leak out or they're not able to build up because we don't absorb and store properly. And so with deficiency, uh, you know, we could say that's going too fast because you're supposed to store it this long, but instead it leaks out too fast. And even something like insomnia, you know, your yang is supposed to go down and be stored underneath all night long. And if you wake up at three or four, when you haven't had enough sleep, that's a leakage. Your yang is coming out when it should be stored, right? And that's going to deplete you. So what, you know, when we're thinking about excess, we're thinking about what do we want to unblock? When we're thinking about deficiency, we're thinking about where do I want to help things store better? You know, how can I help the body store better? So not only build up the actual blood, yin or yang, but increase the body's ability to keep it, you know? Mm -hmm. So we look for ways that qi, blood, yin, yang are being lost in the body through sweating, diarrhea, insomnia, um, you know, hyperactive qi that's not being stored. Um, so, so we, we will bring that kind of view to women's bodies and women's cycles in that um, one day workshop on fertility and early pregnancy. And, you know, so certainly you could think about fertility. And of course, if there's a blockage, it can in inhibit the woman's ability to receive and open but if there's a deficiency there can also be an inability to store right mm -hmm. like part of fertility is being able to take something in and keep it and mm -hmm. keep it well and keep it for the right amount of time um so yeah. do you see the same patterns in infertility as you do with miscarriage are those usually the same patterns or two very distinct much, patterns that you see? They're very much related, you know? And a lot of times um, habitual miscarriage patients um, are considered fertility patients, right? Like someone will come and say, I have, I'm having tr trouble with fertility, but actually you discover, no, you're actually having habitual miscarriages, yeah. you know? Um, so there's a very strong relationship between um, the patterns of fertility and the patterns of habitual miscarriage. Um, and in the, you know, what I find with habitual miscarriage um, is that probably 75% of the women I see for habitual miscarriage um, they have um, what I call crappy blood. And, and 
the, Your technical the term. Call, <laughs> the technical term. But there isn't really a term in um, that I found in Chinese medicine for this combination of blood deficiency and blood stasis, where part of the reason the blood is static is because it's deficient. And part of the reason it's deficient is because it's it's too viscous, you know, that the blood quality is too thick and therefore there's not an abundance of good quality blood. And really, you know, a lot of the classical formulas work with this a lot for fertility and for habitual miscarriage in improving the body's ability to make really good quality blood that's nice and warm, but not too warm, you know, mm -hmm. just, you know, a juicy, moist, nourishing environment. And so I would say like 75% of the women I've seen for habitual miscarriage, they have blood that's not good enough quality. Um, Got it. And it's not, it's not that hard to treat. Um, and, and you use primarily herbs, classical herbal formulas. Do you use, do you have your favorite classical formulas that are your go-tos or do you custom create formulas for each patient or maybe a combination of the two? Yeah, um, I would say I custom create. And even if I'm using, you know, a go-to formula like Dangui Shayasan or something, um, I will um, often adjust it for, or even combine it with other formulas for the individual. Yeah. And is it the individual as they present to you uh, at that time, meaning do the formulas also correspond to a cycle? Do you have them take a specific formula that you've created for a week and then the second week because they're now in a new cycle they have a different formula or would somebody be on the same formula for a whole month or an entire cycle of the woman's cycle um that really depends on the particular case um you know say say for example um a woman um what i would call her um, Xiao Yin is going too fast, meaning it's not storing well, you know, and, and from a TCM perspective, we might say she's kidney young and qi deficient, you know, and so we want to increase her ability to store her young and absorb. For me, the kidney qi is what absorbs and holds and the young keeps it warm. So here she is kidney qi and young deficient. And that's, that's it. There isn't a lot else going on. Then I would be giving her probably the same formula, you know, some kind of Shen Chi Wan mm -hmm. um, throughout her whole cycle, you know, without changing it. That is the exception, that kind of case. Most people have more than one thing going on. You know, so let's say she also has, um, you know, uh, cold in the womb with pretty significant blood stasis. And that manifests as very painful periods where she craves warmth. So then, and, and maybe let's say her periods are also really heavy. And so I'm looking at the heavy periods as um, I can explain the heavy periods by the weakness of the Shaoyin failing to absorb and store, but I can, I can also explain it by this blood stasis. You know, blood stasis is a significant cause of bleeding. So in that kind of case, I before her period, I would start to warm and harmonize her blood in order to move blood stasis. And then once she started bleeding and probably right you know as soon as the pain part was over i would shift you know so i would be helping her to stop heavy bleeding 
and stopped pain before her period. And then as soon as her period was through that initial part, I would start strengthening her kidneys in order to stop bleeding and to aid the absorption and storage of her young and chi. Um, Love it. So definitely, you know, depending on what's going on with the woman, I pay a lot of attention to where she is in the cycle. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And that kind of ties into the discussion that you're going to have during uh, your talk on November 3rd, medicine in our relationship with nature. And we were talking about this before we started uh, recording. And it's fascinating that as you were doing more translations, you've translated thousands, tens of thousands of pages and created a lot of thousands. ebooks. Thousands, <laughs> thousands. It could, we were probably getting close, but thousands. thousands. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> in, in, and so for, for almost 40 years, all of those translations, many of them have been around gynecology, obstetrics. More recently, you've been uncovering this information about our relationship with nature, medicine's relationship with nature, specifically trees, deforestation, the impact it has on us. And you're gonna be talking about that on the third. And I think that's super exciting as well to share with everybody that might not be aware of that dynamic and the interplay between us and nature as practitioners and also just people on the planet. Right. Right. Yes, um, the, the forests um, around where I live in Western Mass, which is Massachusetts, which is heavily forested in the western part of the state, very rural. Um, these forests are under threat from the um, large scale industrial solar industry. And really, this is a problem that's happening all over the world. You know, the company that wants to clear cut hundreds of acres in my town, um, they mainly do their business in India and Japan. You know, so it's happening everywhere. Um, and we feel strongly that, um, that solar should be built on land that's already degraded and that it's absolutely insane to clear cut living forests for solar. Um, and so I've been very involved with trying to stop this um, from happening in our town. And I think and hope we're going to be successful in our fight to stop this. And uh, in the meantime, I've done so much research into what trees and forests do for us in terms of our resilience to climate change. You know, so not only do they sequester carbon and take it out of the environment and which they, you know, the trees and their related ecosystems are the only thing that will do that. Not only do they do that, but they also really help our resilience to heat, you know, all these chi, you know, fire, damp, wind and, and uh, coal, you know, that, that um, the trees really help keep us cool. They help prevent flooding. They help, um, you know, diminish wind. You know, so these things that happen with climate change, the trees here protect us. Um, and I've also been learning a lot about the ways trees work to absorb water and evaporate it back out into the environment and thereby purifying water and slowing it down. It's so interesting, like as I've been studying the trees, you know, these trees that are, I keep going like this because it's behind my house and it's on a hill. And when it rains, you know, the water comes down the hill and the trees really slow the water down. And that's important because the water then has time to drip down into the aquifers. And these aquifers are just this pure, pure water, which is where our drinking water comes from. You know, our, all the people in my town are on wells and all of our water comes from these aquifers. Without the trees, 
there's erosion and the water goes really fast through the landscape and doesn't have a chance to sink into the aquifers. So the wells run dry um, and what's in the wells becomes less pure. And so this is just an example of, this is exactly what happens in our bodies when our earth element is too um, dry and doesn't absorb the fluids that we put into our body. And so we have something called dispersion thirst, which is extremely common. <clears throat> you know, we sort of learn about it as something that happens with advanced diabetes, but it happens in many of our patients, which is that they drink and it doesn't get absorbed into the body because the earth element is too dry or actually too waterlogged to absorb it in a healthy way. And it's much like the soil in our gardens here. You know, when it's really healthy, not only does it absorb water well to create life, it also drains water really well. You know, so it's not going to be, we can, our earth, it can make us resilient to too much rain and it makes us resilient to drought when we have this good soil. So this relationship then between the wood element and the earth element is reflected in our own bodies. And just, I've been kind of constantly amazed, like the trees are just like us, you know, the, and not just the trees, but the soil that they're in and the mycelium, mm -hmm. exactly the same in our own bodies. So um, I haven't completely fleshed out that lecture yet, but um, I'm going to be, talking about that um, with very specific examples from my practice and how we think of the body as this kind of terrain and how we take influences from heaven and bring them into our body and absorb them and put them back out into life um, will be part of what I'm talking about as well. So I love that kind of application. I love it. It's like the, yeah, and it's exciting. It's. I just re always think of the macrocosms, the microcosms that we are reflection of our environments. It's all reflected, um, the holographic nature of the universe and what we're seeing yeah. outside of us is also inside of us. It makes us stronger practitioners to be able to see life and our patients through those different lenses. It really does. I'm excited for your talk on the third. I think that's going to be incredible and probably fun for you if you've been doing gynecology and obstetrics for so long to have something like this come across um, your translations and just your awareness. It's exciting and it's applicable to both. Like you said, both lectures are very applicable to each other and just looking at the natural rhythms of nature, the natural rhythms of the universe. That's what I love about the classics they really talk about that and getting us back in that rhythm is what's going to restore harmony eating for the seasons as simple as that can help bring us back into the natural harmony versus us trying to force something which is a kind of a modern culture of like force it make them ovulate make them you know remove the heat when maybe we just need to remove the block and then let nature take care of the rest or mm don't cut down the trees and allow the trees to do what they're meant to do. Um, I know that you created the White Pines Institute. Um, you're, you also had the White Pines Healing Arts. And then more recently in the past year, you created an amazing um, mentorship, um, which you're going to start up in May. But before that, you started what's called the White Pine Circle. So you basically own White Pines. White Pines, you've covered White Pines, Institute Eating Arts Circle, but you have an online membership organization for practitioners. Is this centered around the same things we've been talking about? Is helping them yeah. understand this yeah, dynamic? Actually, um, you know, I, I don't actually own the White Pine Circle. Um, I'm, a, I'm a board member and it, it, it's part of the, um, the principle actually of the White Pine Circle is um, that it's kind of that the membership itself um, is what the circle is sort of serving 
Um, and so, yeah, people become members. And then we have, um, once you're a member, there are all kinds of educational opportunities by a whole variety of teachers. And the White Pen Circle um, supports our teachers very well. You know, so people who teach there get paid very well. And, um, you know, and it's sort of this idea of, um, in a way, my daughter and I talk about this because she lives here and does permaculture farming. And, you know, and like, putting the resources in so that things naturally come back out. And it's this kind of reciprocal relationship um, between the teachers and the practitioners. And the, some of the teachers are the practitioners, some of the practitioners are the teachers. And you know, so it's a very rich environment of, of sort of the way nature works, of taking in and giving back out again. You know, so it's a reflection of the way these trees, especially for me, white pines. You know, my farm is surrounded by white pines. So, you know, I think about that a lot in relation to um, these principles. So that's the White Pine Circle. It's a wonderful membership organization that people can look at up, the whitepinecircle.org and, um, and become a member if it's interesting. And, um, you know, just wonderful, wonderful teachers, you know, very committed to a very deep relationship with Chinese medicine. Yeah, and then I teach a two and a half year program. Um, it's a mentorship program called the Graduate Mentorship Program. And there's a, I'm in the midst of one now. Um, and there's a new one starting at the end of May in 2023. If people are interested in checking that out, you can go to whitepinehealingarts.org and look for the graduate mentorship program. But we go really deeply into diagnostics and then applying those diagnostics to classical formulas. Um, so you kind of get steeped in these principles and really start to see the world through these eyes of going too fast, going too slow. How do you align somebody? And how do these formulas of Zhang Zhongjing help with that um yeah and you know if you if you've ever read the huang di nei jing um it's completely all about aligning with nature that's what the whole book is like being right with time and the relationship of time and the four directions and the five elements and and then you can look at john john Dean's book and see that's exactly how he's thinking about these uh, confirmations of Taiyang and Yangming, Xiaoyang, Taiyin, Xiaoyin, Zhuiyin. You know, these are move. I call them great sweeping motions. They're movements in directions and time, and the formulas sort of are designed to slow us down or speed us up so that we become right with that. It's very beautiful. Um, it, the more you talk about it, the more I'm sold. I mean, it absolutely sounds beautiful. Uh, this mentorship program is taught by you, correct? That's right. And two, uh, two and a half years, you mentioned to me earlier, it's offered a, kind of a hybrid style. So there are some intensives, but it's also live streamed as well. And then there is some virtual access to the material as well for the two and a half years of the program, the mentorship. Yeah, it had always been live like live three-day weekends. We would have eight live three-day weekends. But with COVID, it to switched to being totally online. And that has its real benefits. And so now it's a hybrid and the first weekend is live and it's also live streamed and recorded. So the recordings go up on our course site. Um, <clears throat> and then um, the first and the last weekend will be live. And that's to, just to give people an opportunity to meet me and meet each other and form a sense of community. And then after we're together for two and a half years, um, then we end with a live weekend so that we can sort of say goodbye to each other. Um, but in between, we're connected um, online throughout the two and a half years. And it got expanded to two and a half years just so we could take our time a little bit more. And we'll have uh, um, summers off pretty much, 
throughout the program so people can digest what we've done and then start anew in the fall and then we'll have summers off to take some time so that that's what made the program two and a half years instead of two years um, so same material um, you know but but just spread out over time i i think the program illustrates what you're trying to share with everybody following the natural rhythms we're meant yes. to have contraction expansion contraction summers we contract you know we expand and so the program seems like it's very reflective of the material taught in the program in the sense that you're not trying to force it all in a four-day intensive rather you're letting everybody learn this um digest it take it back use it in their practical um in applications of their practices and embody the material at a natural pace right i love it yes That's so we try to do yeah so we will get samples of this at symposium you have the pre-symposium day on classical dynamics of fertility and early pregnancy. And then on November 3rd, you're gonna be doing sessions on medicine and relationship with nature. So there's two ways to engage with you at the upcoming symposium in November. And then you will be taking early applications for your two and a half year graduate program or uh, the mentorship program, which begins next May of 2023. Right. Yeah, I think there's an early, early rate <clears throat> that actually is ending September 1st. Then there's an early bird rate. And but that's on that's on White is, Pine. That's on White Pine, uh, White Pine Institute or White Pine Healing Arts. You just look for okay. the graduate mentorship program and yeah. I see, I'm, I have your website up right now. It's gorgeous, whitepineinstitute.org. And you can see said white pines there and a lot of the articles that you've published on um, your translations in all of your work of over 40 years and also just make sure everybody understands there's also an opportunity to join the white pine circle which is the online membership and that can be found on white pines healing arts as well that's right several ways to engage with this lovely human being that is contributing so greatly to our medicine sharon thank you so much for having this talk thank with you. me and letting everybody know a little bit about what you're going to talk about at symposium and more so just get to know you and what you're up to which is i love it it's beautiful it's fascinating and it brings me back to the classics which i find i lose track of in modern day society and then when somebody like you comes across my path and reminds me what drew me to this medicine over 20 years ago for me. I just, I, I'm so grateful for it. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. You've yeah. been so kind. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to see you in symposium because I'll be there. So we'll get to see Good. each other live and in person. Okay, great. It'll be great to meet you. Okay. Me too. Okay. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>